Well, I'm glad it waited until the prayer was over. <laughs> uh, I'd like to, uh, this morning, read just three verses from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. And this morning's sermon is not going to be so much an exposition of this, but this is rather um, just a text that deals with the work of the Spirit of God and the fact that, that He is doing a work and that we need to um, agree with Him, we need to yield to Him, we need to follow Him as He leads us. But also to remind us that there is a warfare that is going on and that's what we're going to look at this evening. So this morning we want to see the work of the Holy Spirit, of the new creation in our lives, what it is that He is doing. This evening we want to see those things that stand against us, that try to stop the Spirit's work and hinder the work and how to overcome these things so that we might walk by the Holy Spirit. Essentially, walking by the Spirit is key. He was given to us in order to change us, and as long as we yield to Him, we will continue to grow in grace. Well, let's begin by reading the text from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Paul writes, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And we are going to come back to that last statement because you know, we're, looking at, <laughs> we're looking at the law and why it is we should obey the law because the Spirit of God has written it, the, the law on our hearts. So is Paul telling us that we don't need to keep it? Is that what he means when he says we're not under the law? No, no that's not what he means, but he does mean that we are not under the law of God to either be justified or condemned. Jesus has delivered us from it by giving us his Spirit, but mainly by uniting us to Him. We have died to the law, Paul tells us in Romans 7, in order to be united to the Lord Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean we don't keep it. He gave us His Spirit so that we would out of love for Him. Well, again, I've been reviewing throughout the, uh, uh, the service already, but just a little more review. Uh, we have seen thus far that God has fixed the problem with the Old Covenant. Uh, in the New Covenant. And the problem, we were reminded, was not the law. Paul tells us the law is holy and righteous and good. The problem was us. We don't want to keep the law. At least we didn't want to keep it when we were outside of Jesus Christ. As long as the law of God is written merely on paper or on tablets of stone, we could not keep it. Knowing what God wanted us to do was not enough. We needed a change of heart. And in the new covenant, God gave us what we needed. He sent His Son to obey His commandments and to die for our disobedience. That's what the Lord's table reminds us of from Lord's Day to Lord's Day. Jesus died to cleanse us of our sins if we would only trust Him to do it. Jesus did these things that He might send His Spirit to write His law on our hearts. And now we love God. And we want to put Him first in our lives according to the first commandment. Now we want to worship the Lord with our whole heart and our whole life according to His will, according to the second commandment. And as we've already seen, we want now to keep our promises to Him as well as use the Lord's name reverently because Jesus is being formed in us by His Holy Spirit. This is the work of the new creation. This is the blessing of the new covenant. Now, I've already told you this past Wednesday we started a series that is related to this. Actually, we could say that everything we study is going to be related to what we are studying in one way or another since it is all God's truth, but I think particularly related entitled, Who is the Holy Spirit by Sinclair Ferguson? And in the first lesson, Ferguson gave us a different perspective on the Spirit and His work that I think is complementary to what we're looking at here, 
showing us what the Spirit of God is actually aiming at as he does his work within our souls. Now, since many of you here aren't able to make it to the Wednesday studies, I thought I would bring these insights uh, this morning because they are helpful. So what I'd like us to do is look at three things that have to do with the Spirit and, and his ministry as we get a running start on this passage, which we're going to look at a bit more fully uh, this evening. We're going to look at three things, who the Spirit is, what the Spirit does, and what his goal is in our lives. And it's particularly point three that I think is, is important, although all of it's important to understand, because the more we understand uh, what the Lord is seeking to do in our lives, the better we will be able to work with him to achieve those goals. Remember this, that God does not work alone in the work of sanctification. He may do that in the work of regeneration, in the work of the new birth, that is entirely, sovereignly, His work alone. But sanctification is something that we must work along with God. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, there is a work that we need to do in our sanctification, but Paul reminds us that that work, even that work, is the work of God. But it's still something that we do along with him. So first of all, who is the Spirit? Well, the Spirit uh, is the third person of the triune God, and I think that's who the Spirit is at the most fundamental level. God reveals Himself as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we understand that. But we need to understand this as well, that all three share exactly the same nature, and they are all equal in power and glory, and all three of them are to be worshipped. And that's one thing that Ferguson emphasized, and I think some, sometimes we do tend to forget that. The Spirit of God is God as well. He is a person, a divine person, and He should be worshipped. So ask yourself this question, when is the last time you worshipped the Spirit? When is the last time you prayed to the Spirit? Actually, we did that just shortly ago, didn't we, when we sang this hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God. When's the last time you thanked the Spirit of God for the things that He is doing for you? Uh, Ferguson reminded us that, that oftentimes we tend to focus on just one of the persons, or maybe we bounce around from one person to the other, not really knowing who it is we ought to focus on, or perhaps, uh, again, it's just sometimes focusing on the Father, thinking about what He has done, or particularly Jesus. I mean, sometimes in these worship services we have focused exclusively on Jesus. And of course, if other denominations perhaps have another bias and, and they may focus solely on the Holy Spirit. But I think in our circles, the Spirit of God is the one we tend to downplay because of His work of drawing attention to the Son. Well, we need to worship all three. Sometimes we get around the issue by using names in our worship that refer to all three persons, such as God. God refers to all three. The Lord, that certainly re refers to all three. But unless we are consciously in our minds and hearts focusing on all three of the persons to give them glory, we're actually excluding one or more of them, and we don't want to do that. Now, one thing that tends to make this even more difficult is the fact that we really don't have a good idea of who the Spirit is. Uh, we know who the Father is. Uh, he's the one who, who loved us. He's the one whom the Son came to reveal. He's the one who chose us from all eternity, sent His Son to save us, adopted us into His family as His sons and daughters, and the one who's going to take care of us throughout all eternity. We know who the Father is. Sometimes, actually, we think we know who the Father is because we, we believe it's the Father that's being revealed to the pages of the Old Testament when, it's, in fact, it's the Son of God who has come to reveal the Father. We also know who the Son is. 
the one who is the eternal Son of God, the one who shares the same nature as the Father, who actually came into this world in our nature to show us the Father, to rescue us from our sins, to rule over us and protect us and provide for us throughout this life, and who is going to come again one day to take us to be home with Him. But you see, when it comes to the Spirit of God, we do know some things about what He does, but we have a difficult time, I think, understanding who He is. Now, we're not embarking on a series on the Holy Spirit this morning, and we really don't have time in one sermon to do an exhaustive study on this particular subject, but I do want to say this much, and maybe something we don't often think about, and that is this. If you know the Father, and you know the Son, you also know the Spirit. You know who He is because He has the same character and He shares the same attributes as the Father and the Son. He is holy. He loves what is good. He has always been. He always will be. He is everywhere at once. He knows everything there is to know. He has the power to do all His holy will, and He never changes. You know, Jesus said on one occasion in John 14, verse 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. But do you understand it's equally true that whoever has seen Jesus has also seen the Spirit because they are all three the same. Now, they're not the same person, but they are all the same in nature and in character. There are some things that, that distinguish them, and this is something that God has revealed to us through the names that He has chosen to call Himself by. The Father is called the Father because He's the one who begets the Son. At least that's how we are to understand this. The Son is called the Son because He is eternally begotten of the Father. He's the eternal Son of God. But the Spirit is called the Spirit because He is eternally breathed out by the Father and the Son. Do you know the word Spirit actually means breath, it means wind. It means, we'll see other things too, communication and animation. Now Edwards, uh, as I've told you in the past, refined this a bit further when he said the Spirit of God is the eternal, personal love that the Father has for the Son and that the Son has for the Father. We talk about the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit, that He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and we don't know exactly what that means. It's kind of a, uh, an interesting statement, but we, we, it's hard to wrap our minds around exactly what that means. Well, what Edwards believed was this, that the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father as it's breathed forth from both of them towards one another is what is the personal love of God or the Holy Spirit. It is that bond of unity between the persons of the Godhead, the love that they share with one another, but it's, it, it is personal. It is a person. He is a person, and He is eternal. There was never a time when He was not proceeding from the Father and the Son, but He is the love of God, and this is what the Father and the Son actually share with us so that we might be one even as they are one. Jesus prayed on one occasion that the Father, that the love the Father had for Him would be in us so that we may be one even as they are one. Understanding that is the Spirit of God. God has given to us His Holy Spirit so that we may love the Son and love the Father and that we may be united together as one even as they are. We don't become one in being, we don't become God, even though we are partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature is the Holy Spirit. He works God's character in us so that we might become like them morally, that we may love what they love, and that we may be one in purpose with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They can be distinguished, but since they are all the one, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God, they are essentially the same in character and nature. Knowing one of them helps us to understand all of them. Actually, I think that's kind of helpful, isn't it? Because, again, we know more about Jesus 
But in knowing about Jesus, we know who the Father is, and knowing about Jesus, we know who the Spirit is because they all share the same character. Now, secondly, by the way, that's why we also worship all three of them. Secondly, what does the Spirit do? Well, here's another way that we can know more about who the Spirit is, and that is by what He does. Now, again, we know what the Father did. The Father loved us. The Father chose us. The Father sent His Son to save us. We know who the Son is. The Son is the one who became one with us who lived and who died, rose again and ascended to redeem us, and He is coming again to take us, to be with Him. But what about the Spirit? What does the Spirit do? Well, He also has a role in the plan of redemption that is consistent with His nature and consistent with His name. Now, one other interesting thing about the Holy Spirit is that one, well, I've already mentioned it, that That eternal procession of the Spirit, which may be explained by the love the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father, is what the Bible uses to characterize His particular work and nature. His nature is love, which is why He is revealed in Scripture as the one who creates this love and who sustains this love in us. Again, I'll point you to another passage in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23, where Paul writes this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. By the way, we're going to come back to that. Um, Paul reminded Timothy on one occasion, law was made for the lawless, not for the righteous. The righteous are those who love what is good. And when you do what is good, you don't have to have a law to command you not to do what is hateful or to do what is loving because that's what you want to do. But notice Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Uh, Another thing I'll just mention and give credit to where credit is due, uh, Jonathan Edwards in his book Charity and its Fruits points out, and I think also in Religious Affections, that all of these characteristics all these fruits of the Spirit really all resolve into one fruit, and that is love. Love is the fountain from which all these other, as it were, expressions of love come. They all resolve back into love. Love is what the Spirit is. Love is what the Spirit gives. And what He does is He gives us the ability to love. He gives us love for God. He gives us love for the people of God. He gives us love for the kingdom of God. He gives us love for the commandments of God. He is the one that Jesus sent into the world in the new covenant to write the law of God on our hearts. So one work of the Spirit is He brings love. He creates love. He's also the one who gives life, eternal life. The Father sent His Son into the world to do what was necessary to save us, but the Spirit of God takes what Jesus did and He applies it to us. He plugs us into Jesus. He connects us with the source of life and we come alive. The word Spirit means that which animates, that which gives life. In the beginning, when God created the, uh, the world, when He created man, He formed man from the dust of the earth, and then He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life, the spirit of life, and man became a living soul. In the same way, in the new covenant, when Jesus comes, He breathes, as it were, His spirit into our souls, and He raises us from the dead, and we become spiritually alive. The spirit of God is the love of God who creates love, but He is also the life of God. He is the one who gives us life, communicates to us what Jesus did. And the Spirit also reveals God. And this is also implied in His name. He is the communication of God. He is the breath of God. He is the voice of God. He is the one who teaches us, the anointing who teaches us all things and who shows us what God wants us to know. He is the one who spoke through the prophets and the apostles. We read in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. 
This is his communication to us and it is given to us by the Spirit. By the way, uh, everything the Spirit of God does in us and in the creation that we're going to see in just a moment is, is also a communication. And we're going to see this in just a few moments. So he is the love of God. He is the life of God. He is the light of God, the knowledge of God. Now, his work of communication, of revealing God, is seen from the very beginning in his work of creation. And here again, we get a differing perspective on the work of the Holy Spirit by Sinclair Ferguson. We read in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, He is the one, uh, the Lord is telling us here, actually the Spirit of God is communicating this because this is His communication, but He is the one who brought form and fullness to the creation. Now, we don't often think about this, but God's first creative act was to make the stuff, as it were, of the world, the stuff of the universe, out of which he would bring an orderly world, a cosmos, over the next six days. The earth, when it began, was formless. It was a wasteland, and it was empty. It was, it was void, which means it was empty. But with each word spoken by God, the Spirit responded to bring form and fullness into the creation. And here we basically have, uh, well, we see a picture of the triune God at work because the Father speaks. And what He speaks is the creative word of God. And then the Spirit, hearing the word, does the work. You know, we talk about who is it among the three persons of the Godhead, who created? Well, they, they all three created. They were all involved as, again, God speaks and the Word comes, as it were, to the Spirit. The Spirit acts and He brings this form and He brings this uh, fullness. The Spirit of God is the one who brought form. He formed the environments, the heavens, the skies, the seas, and the land, and He filled them with creatures. Now, the point is, this is what the Spirit of God does wherever He works. He brings form and He brings fullness, again, through His love and through His life and through His light. When He found us, we were formless. We were without purpose. We had no direction in our lives. We had no idea where we came from, at least if we were raised outside of the, of the church, outside of the Word of God. We didn't know why we were here. We didn't know where we were going. Sin had destroyed our purpose and emptied our lives. But the Spirit renewed us. He revealed to us God's plan. He told us where we came from. We are God's handiwork. He told us why we're here. We're here to glorify Him. And He told us where we're going by His grace we're on our way to heaven because of what Jesus has done for us if we have trusted in Him. Now, the Spirit also filled us when we were empty. Sin had robbed us of life, robbed us of joy, robbed us of hope. We were dead. We had a guilty conscience. We knew we were on our way to judgment. We knew that because of conscience. But now that we're in Jesus Christ, we're full. We know that we're free from judgment. We know that we have life without end. We have fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have the fullness of joy and hope that comes from knowing them in a saving way. This is what the Spirit of God has done for us. So the Spirit of God is the third person of the triune God. He shares the same character, the same nature as God, and obviously he is to be worshipped as God. Uh, what he does, of course, is he brings to us love, he brings to us life, he brings to us knowledge or light, and he works in our lives to bring form and fullness. But finally, what is his purpose? What is his goal in all of this? 
Well, it's interesting because what he's doing in us is the same thing he did in the creation. The Spirit brought form and fullness to the creation, but he did it in order to make it into a temple where God's glory might be revealed. And that's exactly what the creation does. David writes in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. Essentially, God, by His Holy Spirit, brought form and fullness to the creation in order that He might make it into a temple that would declare the glory of God. And by the way, also a place where man might have fellowship with God. And I think this is perhaps true of the creation as a whole, but more particularly of the Garden of Eden where God dwelt and met with the man, where He put the man after He formed him. Now, when He animated the dust that had been fashioned into a man and took up residence in his soul. He not only created someone who could have fellowship with God and did have fellowship with God, he also made one who would lead in this temple, that he would lead creation in the worship of God. Now we know that sin, the fall, destroyed all of this, took made the world again the way it was in the beginning, formless and empty. The Lord says through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 4, verse 23, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. God is representing the creation as actually being brought back to its formless and empty state that it was before the Spirit of God began to work. That's what sin does. It destroys the work of God. But God had a plan to reverse the effects of sin and to bring everything back to the way it was originally, only better. Immediately after the fall, He promised to send the one who would destroy the serpent, who had essentially, through his temptations, brought this curse on the creation. Later, he promised Abraham a seed through whom he would bring blessing to all the nations. Still later, he promised to raise up a seed to David whose kingdom he would establish forever. But he also gave us glimpses into what he was going to do in us and in the creation through the Lord Jesus Christ by raising up another temple. He gifted certain men to create, as it were, a sanctuary in the wilderness, a tabernacle which, if you look at the decor within, resembled the garden, the Garden of Eden, one that was a picture of what it was that God was intending to do through the seed He promised to Eve and to Abraham and to David. The Spirit built another temple where God might declare His glory and where he might meet with man and reconcile man to himself. Well, in the fullness of time, the Spirit built another temple. He came upon the Virgin Mary, and he fashioned within her that human nature of Christ in her womb, a human nature that would be inhabited by a divine person, by God. Jesus actually referred to himself as the temple of God in John chapter 2, verses 19 and verse 21. He said to the Jews, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And of course, they went on to complain, well, how can you do that? It took so many years to build this temple. But Jesus, actually John goes on to explain, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Jesus is the temple of God. He was the one who would declare the glory of God, one in whom God would meet with us and through him reconcile us to himself. And now the Spirit of God is working within us, reconciling us to God in Christ and bringing purpose and fullness into our lives so that he might build us together into a living temple to declare the glory of God. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2 verses 4 through 5, 
and coming to Him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The work of the Spirit of God in us to bring form and fullness is, is not an end in and of itself, but the purpose is that we might become living stones in a temple that is being built up for His glory that we might offer to Him spiritual sacrifices. We are to declare the glory of God. Now, how do we do that? Well, certainly we do that when we meet together to worship the Lord on His day in our praise and our adoration and our listening to His Word and applying this Word. But it, it also happens as the Spirit of God works within us, a Christ-like character, the fruit of the Spirit's work in our hearts as we offer ourselves to God as living sacrifices, as a continual sacrifice for His glory according to the rule that He has given to us. As Paul says in Romans chapter 12, that we would no longer let the world shape our thinking or our values, but that we would let God do so through the fullness of His Spirit and the form of His Word. God is shaping us and He is molding us so that we would now be those who glorify Him and those who lead others to Christ that they might be reconciled to Him. Man's, I told you at the beginning, or actually as we started the section, when the Spirit of God created man, He did so that He might lead worship in this temple, in this temple of creation. Well, the Lord has made us His temple. Uh, because we are now in the Lord Jesus Christ and now in this temple of His creation more largely, we are called upon to be those who lead worship, as it were. Not only uh, reflecting the image of Jesus Christ, but sharing His message with others. Now, as I've said, this is the blessing of the new covenant. Because of the work of God's Spirit, we're no longer the slaves of sin, but now we are the slaves of righteousness. Now we are the children of God. Now we are those who declare the glory of God, which is why Paul tells us in our passage, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And why he also says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. This is that work of the new creation, the change the Lord has actually brought into our lives. If you belong to Jesus, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, you have died to the law and you have been joined with Him. As I said, what this means is you're no longer under the law to be justified or to be condemned. We don't really, in a certain sense, need the law to command us to do what is right because now we want to do what is right. That is the work of the Spirit of God making us into that which gives glory to God. But of course, we still need the law to instruct us because the Spirit of God gives desire, as we saw before, and He only gives content in the Word. We need to read the Word to know what it is the Spirit of God wants us to do. But we also need the law because we have so many things working against us to try to derail us and get us off track. We need the law of God to show us the way to walk in, to get us back on course when our enemies lead us astray. And that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. So in the new covenant, God has given us His Holy Spirit to bring form into our lives. He writes His law in our hearts and gives us a love for what is right to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. And He does it through His own infinite fullness. I mean, He is the fullness of the love of God who dwells in us so that He might change us from the inside out and His purpose is that we might become His temples and those who would love, praise, and serve Him in this world and lead others in the worship of God by bringing not only an example to them but also by bringing the gospel to them. And that 
is a very high privilege and it is a blessing to have that work going on in our lives because it means that by the grace of God, He has saved us. So let me just close in asking you this this morning. Is this what He has done in your life? Do you see yourself being transformed into the image of Jesus? Do you find that purpose? Do you know what your purpose is? Are you pursuing that purpose because you love the Lord? Well, if you are, if you have that, the Spirit of God is at work in you. And obviously that comes through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ because of the infinite love of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit towards you. And for that, you should give Him praise and adoration and give your lives to serve Him. But if He isn't doing that work in you this morning, let me encourage you to look to Jesus, to give you His Spirit, because He's the only one who can give you the Spirit. And the Spirit is the only one who can transform your life that you might experience these blessings of purpose and fullness of life that Jesus came to bring. Only Jesus can grant you that blessing. You need to come to the Father through the Son. You have to trust Jesus to save you. Turn from your sins and follow Him. And the Lord will do it. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a few moments of prayer. and let's, let's search our hearts in this regard because, again, what are the qualifications for coming to the table of the Lord except that we have this work ongoing in our lives? The Spirit of God is working in our lives th through His power, through His love to transform us into the image of Jesus. Before we come to the table, we do need to know that we, we have that transformation going on in our lives. We also need to examine ourselves to make sure that if we have stepped out of line, that we're willing to step back in line, that we're willing to repent and to renew our obedience to the Lord. Uh, so let's spend just a few moments before we come to the table uh, in letting the Lord search our hearts to see if that work is ongoing, to also look for that repentance. But also if we, again, I would just remind you, if we don't see that work, if we don't sense that repentance, if we're not experiencing that desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ out of love for Him, then you need to abstain from coming to the table until you actually do come savingly to the Lord. And I should also mention, you may be a believer and there may be a sin that you're unwilling to repent of, although that is a contradictory situation that has to be resolved at some point. But if it hasn't been resolved, then that's another thing that should keep you from the table. You need to be willing to let go of all your sins, which you will if you have the Spirit of God working uh, within you. So let's spend just a few moments and examine our hearts and prepare to come to the table.